Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to this panel. Thank you all for joining us today. We'll, we will wait for a few more seconds before we go live live. So um, thank you for the participants uh, in this panel and for the speakers and warm greetings from Geneva. We will be as Swiss as possible and start in 10 seconds. Okay. Hello and um, welcome to this uh, panel and good afternoon and thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this concluding panel of uh, the SANA project, the security assessment in North Africa in its third cycle uh, today. So today we are celebrating the ninth birthday of the project, uh, security assessment in North Africa and Sahel Sahara region. And also we would like to take this opportunity to reflect and to discuss some of the thematic issues and some of the regional issues concerning the uh, insecurities, the conflicts, the conflict dynamics that are uh, taking place in the, in the region. Um, my name is Ala Tartir and I'm a researcher at the Small Arms Survey and the project lead of the SANA project. Um, and uh, I'm very honored and pleased to uh, welcome three distinguished uh, experts who are with us today on this panel, Hannah Salam and Monsef Kartas, Rebecca uh, Murray. I will introduce you uh, in a second, but I would like to warmly thank you for being with us today in this um, concluding panel as experts who've, who've been with the SANA uh, project since its start. Uh, as we will uh, see in a, in a second until, until um, uh, today. We are very thankful that you're with us uh, today. So thank you uh, for, uh, for all of your work with us. And thank you for the audience who are with us uh, today. This is a quick reminder that this is a recorded uh, panel and it will be available on our YouTube channel and on our, on our website later um, today. And uh, also another reminder that uh, once we finish the, uh, uh, the cycle of questions and conversation that we will have, we will have a little bit of time for Q&A. So please um, prepare your questions and post them in the chat using the chat uh, function here. And uh, for our audience, if you're not on our mailing lists uh, of the Small Arms Survey, and if you're not following uh, our work on social media, please do it now. Uh, we promise you lots of um, informative publications in your inbox. And um, finally, I would like to thank the government of the Netherlands and the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs for their continuous uh, support and investment in, in our work at the Small Arm Survey generally, and more specifically at the project of the security assessment in, um, in North Africa. So um, let me introduce um, our experts, uh, who all of them are uh, internationally recognized experts uh, coming to us with wealth of knowledge and expertise. Um, and uh, we have the opportunity to raise a number of questions uh, to them today. Um, uh, Dr. Monsef Kartas is uh, an international consultant, a former member of the UN panel of experts on Libya and also a research associate at the Center on Conflict Development and Peacebuilding at the Graduate Institute uh, here in Geneva. Uh, Rebecca Murray is a senior analyst with the Global Initiative, a Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, and her focus is Libya, uh, which is a country she has both lived and visited and worked on as a journalist and researcher from 2012 until uh, the present day. And finally, Hannah Salama, who she is a researcher in the Gender and Disarmament Program at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, UNITER, 
And her areas of expertise include gender analysis, civilian casualty recording, protection of civilian in conflict, small arms control, and disarmament. Um, the, uh, thank you so much again uh, for the three distinguished speakers for being with us today and for examining and reflecting on past and present regional and security dynamics and uh, through different uh, analytical lenses that you used for your research for Sana and, uh, and beyond. So maybe uh, let me start um, let me start this conversation first by uh, raising a question to Monsef. And uh, Monsef, um, you are actually the founder of this uh, of this project, the security assessment in uh, in North Africa. And in, back in 2012, you started this project in the aftermath of the uh, Arab uprising, especially following the changes and the crisis in Libya. So, why did you think at that time, if we take you back nine years ago from now, why did you think that such a project uh, matters actually? And did you expect that we will be celebrating its ninth birthday now and talking about another three years of it? Thank you, uh, Allah, first for having me, but then also really honored to be with Rebecca and, and Hannah on, on, on this panel. Um, yeah, actually, I think there was less a thought process than just the chance that happened <laughs> at the time. Uh, you know, I've, I've previously been working mostly on, on sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, and with the changes that occurred, I was just, I saw an opportunity to, to work uh, on a region where I had my origins also partly from, and, and that was exciting to, to be able to bring skills, so to say, that you have developed somewhere else on, on issues that you're interested in, in a, in a region that directly matters to you and your life, your community, your, your family. And um, I started to work on Tunisia and, uh, and on the, the role of the security forces in, in the evolution of post-colonial Tunisia and, and its role in, in the changes and especially also looking then forward at what, how will security forces, what role will they play in the, in the changes? And um, well, I was, I was doing research in, in, in Tunisia and there was a lot of accumulations basically of science that, that kind of disconcerted me with the background I had. And uh, so I, I started to basically really randomly say, okay, let's, let's travel towards the south, towards the, the, the border and, and see a bit what is going on, build up a network of people based on, on, on old uh, acquaintances. And uh, yeah, and I was just seeing a lot of worrying signs and I had the feeling something is going uh, wrong here. And uh, I wasn't sure I wanted to do more research. And at that time I had just finished uh, writing a chapter that has just been published with the survey, the yearly book on Madagascar. And um, yeah, I contacted the survey and uh, actually I would say that the real founder is uh, Nicolas Florquin because he was the one who had done the first scoping mission to Libya and, 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 and really then initiated the, the first funding round and, and with, with other colleagues. So uh, it's, it's, not, um, it's not really me in that sense. And uh, yeah, and I, I was just then lucky to be in that situation and asking if they were interested in, if the survey was interested in, in doing a study, a paper on the Tunisian Lib Libyan border. And then at the same time, Sana was coming up um, and had to be still shaped and everything. So yes, I had a bit of a contribution in it. And then we, yeah, it's all, th all things came together and uh, it, it was a, a, an interesting start. And why did it matter? Well, basically because I was looking at the situation where we were in those fragile transitions and you know, uh, in the in the first couple of months or in the first year, we were all hell hopeful that this would take the right path and and go the right direction. But uh, Libya was such an influential country at so many levels, geopolitically, uh, economically, for uh, for its neighboring country, that it became clear that uh, whatever happens in Libya and especially potential. Um, drivers of insecurity coming out of, of Libya would have a huge impact on, on, on all the region. 
And uh, I think this has been proven right since then. Uh, and the um, and, and that's why I think that this program is also so important because it just doesn't just look at, at Libya. Uh, uh, and, and we spoke a bit before we were recording about the logo. And I mean, I think yeah, the message from the logo initially was exactly to say it's not just about Libya, but it's about these concentric circles of uh, 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 the ripple effect, so to say, of what is going on in Libya in, in the region. And I think this has been a kind of a, a constant theme for, uh, for the, the assessment. And I think it's part of its success, actually, because it has this, this broader perspective. And if I thought that this would be still uh, relevant today, or yes, <laughs> uh, I mean, we're talking about processes that, that are long-term, that are taking a lot of time. And, uh, you know, uh, again, we really have to understand that, that Libya played, I mean, especially under the Gaddafi regime, Libya played an important role politically and economically, not just for North Africa, but also for Sub-Saharan Africa, and especially Sahara Sahel. Um, what a lot of people underestimate, because at the time there wasn't so much research on it, is, is the size and the importance of the informal economy that is, and, and where Libya plays simply one of the key aspects uh, uh, of, of that informal economy because of tax-free imports basically uh, into Libya. And this has created the vast networks of informal markets and, and economies that, that you have in the region. And they have shaped so many things. They have shaped border communities. They have shaped economic relationships. They have such an impact that there is no reason why one would think that this this would be over or that this you know there wouldn't be uh, a lot of things that we would have to continue to research, analyze, and understand over time. So I think Sana will exist as long as the survey exists. To be honest, and uh, I'm I'm happy about it and. Uh, I think I'm, I'm sure it will continue to produce the, the same high quality research and analysis it has done over the, the years. So um, I think what, what I've been not expecting is that Libya, the focus on Libya would have turned away perhaps from that. We were really focused on small arms and light weapons and that's what the survey does. But if you look at Libya in general and it's not necessarily where yes, the, 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 the SANA is going, but it's just we're, we've gone a lot from small arms survey to very heavy weaponry to 21st century warfare technologies and so on. So that is probably something I, I, I hadn't expected that we would move into into very different territories for Libya. I mean, generally, not necessarily for for the survey. Yeah. And lots of after after you work with the small arms survey as a coordinator of the project that you between 2016 and 2019, and as a member of the UN panel of experts on Libya, you were in charge of uh, monitoring and investigating uh, violations of our embargo, arms embargoes. So how can uh, a project like this project, like the SANA project help and contribute um, to the UN panel of experts uh, mission and their work? Well, first, I mean, the, <laughs> first, actually, this is already where, where there is always a misunderstanding about the role of the panel. And I think this is a, a unhappy development, and, and we might come to talk about it later, about, about the panel work in general. I think it has too much focus on violations of, of the, the embargo and too little interest in, uh, in, 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 in looking at more general assessments of, of the sanctions regime. Uh, as a as a as a as a way to correct course correct the way sanctions are are designed so it has it has narrowed its focus i guess too much analytically speaking um and and i and that's relevant because that's relevant of how i see uh, sana's role so of course first thing is um as 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 this uh, security assessment in north africa uh we we have always seen it as our responsibility to support the panel work. Panel work falls on, falls on the chapter seven of the UN Charter. Uh, and, and so there is, there is a certain obligations to be working with the, with the panel. And so we've shared information, data, whatever we had. Uh, obviously, it didn't hurt the fact that uh, uh, we had another colleague, you, I guess you already interviewed uh, her, <laughs> uh, 
uh, Savannah, uh, who, who at the time was on the on the panel uh, of experts. And so so we know each other and we knew also as other people in, in the panel. But so that's the first thing. So when when we generally had something that we could what we, sh we thought would, would be useful for the panel, we, we were happy to, to share. And I, I think is, um, un I mean, that was my attitude and this has always been my attitude. I, I, I don't mind sharing information. I think it's important. I think actually information should flow uh, within uh, the community of, of uh, analysts and specialists and between the, the research uh, institutions. And um, I, 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 I'm always a bit disturbed by this notion of, of keeping things for oneself and, and all these issues, because that is not bringing us in terms of the knowledge forward. So we share information. At the end, it's analysis. So security assessment in North Africa stands out for its analytical capacity, not just for the data collection. And uh, that's, I think, where you have your, your trademark. I think this is where we developed the trademark. We were having based on the data compelling narratives that were presenting the problems differently, asking questions in a way others would not ask questions, seeing things that others were not seeing. And that's also where we were important in terms of support this is a more indirect form of, of support to the panel. But because we had a lot of influence at the policy level with the different circles, it created also a space where governments and different authorities were much more aware of the importance of the issues. And I think that has also had an importance in, or a factor playing into the support then ultimately that the panel experiences um, in, from, from government authorities and other uh, uh, institutions. So I, th I think one should not underestimate and really at the time, what perhaps a lot of people do not realize is that the security assessment in North Africa was one of the only <laughs> institutions and outfits that that was reporting on those issues, and that was bringing, uh, you know, solid evidence and solid data, quality field research to to a broader policy audience. Yeah. Thank you, Monsef. Um, thank you for all these important insights. And um, you know, this is another reminder for the audience with us. Please ask it, ask your questions in the chat uh, function. But may, let me move to Rebecca and you know connect what you just, just said with uh, the research that Rebecca conducted over over the years for for the Sana. And Rebecca, here um, one of your first um, Sana publications uh, published in two thousand seventeen. Uh, tackled the conflict in South Libya, and particularly in Ubari. At that time, uh, South Libya did not attract much attention, re research uh, speaking here. And now it, uh, it even deserves more attention with all the rapid developments that are happening uh, as we speak, actually. And you warned in your research at that time that the peace deal that um, was eventually brokered between the different actors uh, to end the Ubari conflict was a rather fragile one. How do you assess it now? How do you assess that peace deal uh, as of today? And maybe more broadly, what is happening in the South uh, these days? Uh, and what are the consequences of what's happening on the South on the rest of Libya in terms of power dynamics and so on? That's a huge question, Ala. First of all, thanks very much for having me and uh, to be talking with also Monsef and Hannah. Um, in, in terms of uh, Ubari, I, I focused on that uh, for Sana um, back in, it was uh, the year of 2014, 15 and 16, where I made consecutive visits. And basically what I was watching was this town, a uh, small desert town near the borders of uh, Niger, Chad um, and Algeria, um, next to a very large oil field called Sharara oil field, very lucrative. Um, I was watching uh, two local communities Tuareg and the Tebu uh, facing off in conflict 
uh, but a conflict that seemed bigger than them. It seemed like a proxy war. Uh, and, um, and they were just players in this, perhaps to divide and rule. Uh, the big takeaways I took from uh, that research then was that one, these were communities that were very marginalized uh, previously, uh, especially under the Gaddafi regime, um, and also had fled from uh, various other places in the Sahel um, and had come to Southern Libya. Um, and also they were lacking uh, rights, especially um, um, jobs, for instance, even even uh, even uh, uh, just uh, lawful jobs. So what they were doing was turning to an illicit economy uh, to survive, uh, pretty much because they were cornered into that. Um, so there was this um, idea of one feeling excluded from the larger Libya and two um, uh, you know, proxy powers kind of interfering with their existence. This has not been a new uh, thing or very unique to, uh, to Ubari itself. In fact, um, when I first went to Libya, uh, I managed to go to the town of Kufra twice, which was in the remote Southeast. Um, it's on the border with Egypt and Sudan. Um, and it too had two uh, predominant communities, the Arab Zawaya and again, the Tebu. Uh, the Arab Zouaia had been favored under Gaddafi um, and had been pretty dominant in the illicit smuggling where people look the other way. Uh, and this is to do with fuel, to do uh, with people. Um, while the Tebu were really marginalized again uh, in, their, in their homes, uh, many of them lacking no ID, et cetera. Um, when I went uh, twice, first I went to stay with the Zouaia. Uh, this was after the 2011 uprising and they were really, really upset. Uh, their big trucks that were used for the economy had stalled um, and there were clashes going on with the neighboring Tebu. Um, I wanted to get a bit closer to it, so I returned back again. And, and at this time, uh, and I think Monsef knows this as well uh, from covering the area at this time, Libya, you could move around Libya relatively, you know, there were some, <laughs> there were some challenges, but it was much easier to navigate uh, than now. I returned again to this town, which is suspicious by nature. It's very small and very divided. Um, and there again was the big battle, but this was on the Tebu side. And I really heard about their experience, but also how they had kind of triumphed during the revolution by casting their lot in with their revolutionaries at their time and seizing control of the southern border from Egypt, Sudan, all the way uh, to near Obari, uh, south, uh, just south of Khartoum. Uh, this was very important for them because if they control the border, then they kind of control uh, everything that goes in or out. And for once they could graduate uh, with their Toyota pickup trucks at the time, as opposed to the big trucks in bringing migrants over uh, the border and also bringing food supplies or gasoline out. Uh, so this was was the dynamic then, it's that they had toppled the predominant uh, people of that area. This was interesting because it was duplicated again in Ubari when I first went in 2013. At that time, um, we saw the Tebu um, were quite triumphant again from, uh, from the 2011 revolution and they had teamed up. They were pretty much the guards of the Zintan uh, uh, militias that had come down from the Northwest and who had seized control of the lucrative oil fields. And the Tebu were working with them and profiting from, from this experience, they control of the surrounds and the Tendi mountain, et cetera. I bring this up because I noticed um, at that time so much animosity between the two communities of Tebu and Tuareg that had not been fighting during the revolution at all. It wasn't in their interests to side uh, against one or the other. Um, so one could see a lot of animosity and returning back a year later, the fight broke out. And, and that's what my report was about for Sana. So I was grateful to have built upon these different experiences along the border. Um, when that fight broke out, it was Zintan that withdrew and it was Mizrata that came 
from the north, the third force, and moved in Sharara oil fields and, and, and kind of was there uh, managing everything with the Tuareg, this in turn, as their guards. Uh, they were also in Sebha at the time, too. Uh, so what we were seeing, we were seeing very local dynamics, but uh, eclipsed by much more uh, national powers. Um, and again, uh, we had split governments at that time. So there was the more hardline Tripoli based government called the General National Congress on one side. Um, you had Hefter really dominating the East and the alliances that go with it. Uh, when the GNA came in, which was the UN broker uh, GNA, uh, they came in in 2016, Siraj, uh, Prime Minister Siraj came in. And this is pretty much when the fighting uh, wound down at early 2016 and involved a lot of peace talks, as you mentioned, a lot of negotiations, etc. But the one thing through that whole time of Obari, uh, where the town was pretty much uh, devastated and very impoverished at the same time. Uh, Tebu and Tuareg uh, leaders and, and citizens kept on asking me, uh, kept on telling me, uh, we don't understand why we're fighting each other. There's a bigger hand uh, behind this. They couldn't, you know, there was the primal hatred of, you know, retaliation, but the bigger picture, they couldn't quite get why they were fighting. And since then, even though that piece was resolved with putting Hassana in the middle as, as mediators, which was another tribe in the region, um, it has still continued with a balance uh, of powers. Since I have, um, since I finished uh, that research, uh, what we did see is, uh, for instance, uh, Khalifa Heftar, before he went and invaded Tripoli uh, in April 2019, he first went into the south. He dipped in uh, to again consolidate and then move up uh, to the north. And that was really one month before people were very uh, surprised. Um, but he did manage to get a lot of supporters, etc., make a lot of affiliations, um, and then attacked uh, Tripoli at the beginning of April, having withdrawn actually a lot of his forces from the South just after he had come in. Um, the reason why I say this is we are seeing this circular motion all the time. Today, uh, what we're seeing is still um, Heftar's affiliates very much uh, in the South, though it seems quite broken up. Uh, you know, there isn't one promise to be held. You see the GN, uh, GNA and now the G GNU, uh, the National Unity Government that is now uh, in, in power in Tripoli, you see them very weak in the South, um, where you see the uh, Tebu and Tuareg are kind of casting their sides on both sides, you know, saying yes to one, saying yes to the other, trying to mediate through this. Um, but with very little uh, to get back. Uh, the, the oil field is still going. We've since had other visitors to it, for instance, even the Russian Wagner force. Um, and um, most recently we've seen uh, Hefter affiliates move in very fast, claim they have been along the border with Algeria, which is near Ghat, um, probably to stake a claim just uh, before tomorrow's uh, Berlin 2 conference starts, just to show that they're present. Uh, so all of this shows that uh, we're seeing things in circles. I will come back to Berlin conference and also some of the regional influences um, in a second, uh, but um, um, sticking to the idea of asking big questions and in, uh, in, in more recent uh, research, um, you focused on mi migration issues. Uh, and uh, can you tell us some of your main observations on the current trends on uh, trends of migrations from southern borders to Mediterranean Sea? Sure, my main takeaway this year, it, it, it's an interesting one because uh, previously going back to the south and, 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 uh, and traveling with both the Tebu border guard from, uh, from uh, let's say the mid-south, which is Merzouk, all the way to Rebiana and Kufra with the Tebu border guard, I, I saw one thing, which is very small, lacking capacity uh, completely um, and very far 
from the north and especially Tripoli and governance. Um, and the same thing happened uh, also with uh, the border with uh, Niger and Algeria. Uh, when I visited there, there were two border guards actually, 401 and 411 who were securing the border along uh, Algeria where Hefter is claiming he is now, it's the Assayan border pass. Uh, but they lacked in capacity so much. I mean, I, I went to one of them 411 and they had one car between them but had run out of gas um they were watching a tv couldn't get anywhere and asked uh if we could drive them back uh to uh barricade near um near gats so they could get some lunch so that was really was really bare bones and they were waiting for the government in tripoli to funnel cash down to them but that did not materialize um, same with 401, which is more affiliated with Hefter, but again, their neighbors, really, their Tuareg, and I think this was symbolic, their border posts were side by side. They claim to be on opposing sides of the Libya conflict, but really they're the same, uh, <laughs> they're, they're in the same milieu in, uh, in, in Gat. Um, and they had even worse, they had no funds. So what's surprising about this year, um, actually um, also because of the security risk, it just got worse and worse in the South, um, is how much interest uh, outside uh, outside uh, states have now in the southern borders and securing them, and especially uh, the EU, for instance, uh, seeing that this is the time, this is the opportunity uh, to implement border guards, surveillance, uh, all, all the things they wanted to to buttress the southern border um, in regards to mostly migration. Um, for migration. Uh, we are seeing uh, peaks of people leaving uh, Libya by sea, so the other, the sea border. Um, they probably resemble 2018, the first half of 2018. They're at quite a high, as well as though the Libya Coast Guard, which is also funded by uh, European uh, states in the EU, um, has also been... Uh, uh, rescuing people, let's say, and bringing them back to Libya as opposed uh, to letting them go forth to to Europe, at a at also very high uh, very high capacity right now, and just seeing um, the activity, which actually reminds me a lot of when the GNA first came in, of foreign diplomats, especially European diplomats, moving in and out of the capital, um, and really looking at this as an opportunity to implement their ideas. So it all ties back in because how much will this buy into the local community? Will it work? Will it be effective? Will it create jobs and economy down south? Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for all these um, insights and um, the publications that we mentioned that um, the three of you uh, authored uh, for SANA are also available in the, in the chat function. But let me continue in this thread on reflecting on our or, or newer uh, SANA publications by moving to, to Hannah. And Hannah, here, uh, your first um, SANA publications back in 2018 you investigated the different challenges to measuring casualties in Libya and uh, contributed to the discussion on developing a standardized, standardized methodology um, and operational mechanisms to meet indicators 16.1.2 uh, of the SDGs. And later on in your uh, next um, SANA publications, you uh, tackled the same question, but you looked at it from a different uh, perspective by analyzing how UN peace operations contributed to this um, global casualty recording data collection efforts. So why? why? Why do you think this standardized methodology and operation mechanism for counting casualties, why do they matter? Uh, why they are important and why they are needed uh, in the region? I know it's another big question, but uh, the challenge is uh, on you now. Yeah, well, it's interesting. So um, thank you, first of all, for having me being part of the concluding panels. Um, I guess my work and my research is a little bit different um, uh, in terms of uh, looking at the region from a really macro perspective and the challenges of, of 
of conflict analysis. In fact, it, this is this is uh, the essence of it. And um, you know what I appreciate about the uh, Sana project is is a little bit what Munsif was saying at the beginning. It really takes a, sort of a regional transborder um, perspective on the, the conflicts that are happening, whether it's Libya or Mali or the spillovers in Niger and Burkina Faso, um, and even all the way to Syria. <laughs> so we've had, and Egypt. So we've had a lot of publications, um, you know, which went, which touched a little bit outside the region, really acknowledging sort of the interconnectedness of issues like, um, the illicit arms trade and um, violence uh, and things like that. So, what my you know what my research focuses on is really um, important at this time, I think, because the the crises are really deepening as a result of the pandemic, and there's really a need for uh, actors that are working in these conflicts, whether it's Mali, Libya, uh, you know, DRC. Um, to, to make decisions based on a comparable overview of the situation. So how do we get to you know, the comparability uh, of what's happening? You know, we need data, but, but the problem is we have really very few data points for this region. This region, uh, and, and I talk about North Africa and the Sahel, is, is not, um, is not uh, let's say, well equipped with institutions that can provide um, baseline data. Uh, and so in that sense, we need, we need to look at something in a quantitative way, because that is what decision makers are asking for. You know, they're asking for evidence on uh, which to base humanitarian action, political decision, uh, et cetera. So um, in my view, the first kind of most basic thing that we should look at um, is data on direct deaths and injury as, as part of the, the conflict. Um, and so th this doesn't only help us analyze the conflict, but it also provides tools for humanitarian response and conflict prevention. Um, and I, I just want to emphasize that this data is, is by no means the only thing we should be collecting, and there should be a lot more um, different types of data, for example, health and migration data that we could more that we could access uh, at a national level um, that would help us tell sort of the stories uh, around the, the conflict and analyze the conflict. But, you know, casualty recording data, it's not just, um, you know, how many people were killed on a certain day, it's, it's really looking at uh, a whole set of information that should be standardized. Uh, so, so things like where the violence is occurring, um, to whom, what groups, you know, um, women, uh, children, um, and also what type of weapons are involved. So eventually, you know, we can tell a better and more accurate story of this of the conflict. Um, so you mentioned the papers. I think um, the, the last paper, uh, the missing man or missing mandate uh, on UN peace operations really, um, I think highlights the importance of this data and how this is being used currently in UN peace um, keeping operations. And so uh, I think the people I interviewed uh, across um, the three uh, peacekeeping operations or, or peace operations in Africa, they all highlighted this, this hunger, this need for more data and um, the, the usefulness um, of uh, just even having casualty data, which as I say, is a very basic form uh, of what we could be collecting. Um, and so like an example of how they were using it, you know, they, they all acknowledge that um, it helps them with implementing different parts of the mandate, including protection of civilians, protecting human rights and conflict prevention. And, um, you know, there's several examples in the paper, but I'll just uh, speak about MINUSMA because it's uh, within the, the SANA scope uh, geography wise. Um, and it's, it's a very complex, um, you know, multidimensional mission and UN peace operation in Mali. And there they are collecting um, huge amounts of data on casualties, on, on, on weapons. Um, and in 2018, the Protection of Civilian Unit uh, sought to better understand the conflict in Mali. So they started collecting casualty and injury data and to improve the situa situational awareness of the conflict. 
Um, and so what they found is really um, a change in the nature of the violence in Mali, uh, going from what they thought was intercommunal violence and grievances to um, more radicalization and Islamic jihadist group influencing um, this type of violence and more in the center. So the location, the focus of the mission uh, changed and actually the mandate of the mission as a result of this kind of data and other, uh, other intelligence sources uh, was extended to cover um, and deploy in the center of Mali. Um, as opposed to just the, the north. Um, so that's, I think, is a really good example of, you know, why it's important to collect this kind of data in the region, where, as I think Munsif and Rebecca noted, things change so fast, and the nature of violence changes so fast. Um, and this is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was really interesting speaking to people who are you know, based there and are monitoring these conflicts because they're they're also at a lack. They also are at a lack of defining the violence. They're like, we, this is you know, we don't know what to call this intercommunal violence or you know, radicalization. There's an intersect uh, and overlapping of different kinds of violence, and sometimes it's important to identify identify it to to sort of respond to it. Um, I think you also asked me about um, you know why should we why should we have a standardized methodology? Um, and I think the Libya paper, so you mentioned that the first paper I produced in, in um, with Sana was on Libya and it was about um, measuring um, casualties. And, and that really came out of um, everybody's confusion about what is happening in Libya, who is killing who, um, where are these numbers coming from? Like we had a, a sort of, a group that nobody knew their origins, but they were producing casualty data regularly, and that got picked up by the media and recycled. But, you know, in my research, I never found out who they were and what their methodology was, which is just, you know, it, it creates some distrust um, and um, some doubts around these things. So methodology, I think, you know, First of all, having a credible methodology is key for the data being used by decision makers, as I mentioned. Um, but it also highlights um, the pitfalls of not having a, a, a methodology, right? The, the pitfalls being, you know, the numbers become highly politicized. They can be used on both or several sides of the conflict in, uh, when it comes to Libya. In Libya, these numbers were and these figures were at basis of giving people, um, you know, uh, victims assistance to people by the government. And so if you were counted or not as a martyr, and that, that word, you know, carries a lot of meaning and carries a lot of um, um, even financial um, implications, because if you were not a martyr, you would not get uh, any sort of compensation for your family. Um, so it, it, it we needed to know how the government arrives to its assessments <laughs> and how how they they calculated it and um without that you know i think i think as you know earlier on in the conflict there was a couple of of casualty figures by by the government by you know a group uh, on the internet and by some ngos and then it it sort of became highly politicized that all parties stopped you know, producing these numbers. And then we really lost a valuable piece of information because of that, because there was no sort of agreed methodology or trusted partner that could really, you know, for example, the UN that could really publish um, casualty figures in that sense. Um, yeah. I think, with, I think with all these examples, you really provided very strong um, or convincing argument why it is uh, why it is important and why it is needed, especially for the region. But the question: Where do we stand as of today? Like, what is the current state of casualty recording efforts? Um, are we any closer to fulfilling the target or the indicator of the uh, SDGs? Or, or maybe the question should be: How far we are still? So, yeah. No. Well, first of all, I think that you know we have this. Um, commitment through the SDGs for states to be publishing um, conflict-related deaths. 
uh, and also uh, violent, violent related deaths. So if um, this is already a milestone to begin with, um, is having this within the indicator framework of the SDGs and, and, and in theory having countries say, yes, we will tell you how many people have died in our country as a result of a devastating conflict. Now, in practice, it's, it doesn't happen that way. Um, countries will not and are, have not been sharing any sort of official statistics on casualties. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't get the data um, through other means. And in fact, um, what I believe is happening at the UN um, today, and don't quote me even though I'm from Unity or because we don't work on these issues uh, currently, but um, from a trusted source is that um, and, it, and it's all, uh, I think, published, is that um, the, the casualty data has been gathered by, for 12 countries um, by the UN itself and the Office of the Human Rights um, Commission, High Commissioner. Um, and those should be you know, published in the upcoming SDG um, report by the SG as a baseline. Um, and I know that further work is being done to integrate different data sources and bring together, you know, um, national human rights institutions, um, national statistics offices and NGOs and academia uh, to, to uh, sort of conform or to, to work on a common methodology. And, and this methodology has already been established by the UN, uh, which is again, a really great, um, sort of development because at the beginning of the indicator framework, of course, this, and this is why the small arms survey chose to work on these issues is that it was um, uh, uncertain whether we would keep this as an indicator for the SDGs and SDG 16. And now we are pretty confident that this will remain an indicator and that we have an established methodology. And there is some baseline data which will be published. Of course, I think there's still a lot of work to be done, um, we're looking at um, you know how to estimate undocumented deaths, um, and again bring other uh, data actors together, uh, and this will need um, you know a fair you know some amount of resources and, and efforts, um, and so I look forward to the the next uh, SG report uh, on the SDGs. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for, for all of that. I'm, I'm aware of the time is moving very fast I'm, and I'm enjoying this conversation a lot. But I would like to go back to Monset. And um, also, um, you know, you mentioned during your earlier intervention, the first, um, your first publications or with Sana that tackled issues related to trafficking and insecurity at the Tunisian Libyan borders. So, and that was back in 2012, 2013. But as of today, are there any um, main issues that you would like to highlight related to trafficking and security at the Tunisian-Libyan borders? And maybe as a, a follow-up question to this that goes um, beyond the Tunisia-Libya borders and looking more at the regional level, especially that the region seems to be always in a status of crisis, conflict, uh, or troubled transition. Are there any regional dynamics uh, or evolving dynamics, evolving, evolving insecurities that uh, we need to keep an eye on at the regional level? Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, I just would like to highlight that I've not been uh, at the border area since February 2019. So uh, absolutely, what is the, the most current state there? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware, but in, in, in big picture, I think that really the turning point for the border area has been the the attack uh, on the city of Ben Gerden by these fighters that uh, claim to be um, Islamic State. Um, and I think it's, it's, it, I, I think that attack and, and what follows out of it, and I already kind of peeked into questions that came in the chat, and I think that links also to that question, um, is the there has been a fundamental misinterpretation of what was going on there and what has happened uh, uh, since then. I mean, the, the, the Islamic State 
fighters that fought there. There were a, 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 a large number of them, a considerable number of them at least, were from, from Ben Gaden and, and the areas. And their, their attempt of an attack was actually uh, bizarrely reminiscent of uh, an attack that was staged in the 70s by uh, uh, Tunisian groups that were supported by the Gaddafi regime in, in Gafsa. And the, the hope was basically that this would spark an insurgency, an uprising, and, and that with the support of the community, of the people, they would take arms, they would mobilize, and that would give them a chance to kind of position themselves there. Um, and, and that despite actually the, let's say, the militarily small capacities that they had at the moment that they conducted the attack. So I don't, I don't think that the way they were organizing the attacks, despite the fact that we know that somehow it has been a bit rushed and that was planned, but even if they had come with full numbers and full capacities, it would never have been a real, real threat for, unless there would have been this, this uprising moment. It didn't happen. And, and I think, <laughs> that, and, and funnily enough, the question of why it didn't happen and all that is one that has hardly been looked at. And uh, yes, I know it's true. I, I, I am a bit, I, I, I am regularly, I was at least before regularly in Ben Gaden. I know the people there. And, um, and, and I think I, I see the things from, from a different perspective and with a different lens. Um, the attack that faltered really just mainly because the people of Ben Gaden were not at all supportive of it. They, they sided, not just they sided with the security, forces, they, they were against the Islamic State at this time. And what's interesting is that no one really took off that issue and said, ah, okay, uh, IS was wrong. The security institutions and analysts that were all the time basically stigmatizing the population on these border areas as supportive of uh, violent extremism and so on uh, were wrong. And since then, Ben then has uh, basically is celebrating uh, that date every year. Uh, I was part of those celebrations a couple of times. And, and they take a lot of pride in, in them being resistant and resilient to, to that situation. So there's been a narrative, constant one on, on the border region that they, they were not seeing themselves as part of, of Tunisia, not being nationalist, uh, being supportive of, of, of these things and so on. And because their informal economy is one of the main sources of activity there, and so basically that they're <laughs> breaking rules on a daily basis multiple times, uh, that, that they saw themselves like outside of, of the broader society and, and were anti-government, anti-state in, in, in a way. And um, I, the stigmatization is, 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 uh, is profoundly flawed. And I think that what is happening there since then is, is showing that this is flawed. It doesn't mean that there is not resistance, there is no suspicion against the state and all that, that there is a wall embrace of contrast, because honestly, the people in this, the communities in these border areas have not experienced anything else but suppression, oppression, and marginalization and neglect before the end of colonialism under the French. Uh, protectorate and after under Bogiba and under Ben Ali. So it's been their constant history of uh, forced settlement, marginalization, impoverishment, and so on. So taking into account their experience, it's actually, and, their, and, and uh, over the past decades, it's actually surprising how supportive they are of things. It's surprising how uh, how resilient they, uh, they were. What is the reaction that we have, however, from the international community, from the government in Tunisia, from the security forces, is not to focus on saying, oh, what can we do for these communities? How can we support these communities? How can we work with those communities? No, it's let's have trenches. 
let's increase and let's waste and burn a lot of money into technical solution to problems that are social, political, and economic. And this has basically been the, the, the major flaw. It's a huge intellectual, conceptual failure at all levels of uh, dealing with these border areas. And I, I'm sure Rebecca <laughs> will see things uh, relatively similarly uh, as she has spent a lot of times with, with uh, border communities too. Um, so the Ben then attack has actually been used to reinforce this counter-terrorist narrative um, with which today um, systematic violations of human rights uh, in Tunisia are justified. In Libya, the whole Haftar narrative is a, a counter-terrorism, anti-terrorist uh, narrative. Um, governments and states are getting involved in the Libyan con conflict, like the Emirates, Egypt, and so on, are using terrorism as an argument to justify their uh, position. And the problem is that the international community, and especially Western countries, have nothing to hold against it because they've used the narrative for a decade before in, in the situation. And, uh, and that is actually the sad, saddest part because there is nothing that is counterbalancing it um, and trying to, to work with those communities. So, you know, generally the evolution of, of the border is that because of the dynamics, much more because of the dynamics in Libya and far less because of border security measures that have been implied or anything. The economy, the informal economy has not run dry, but has really, really gone down in between the two borders. Um, the, the big threat that was painted about violent extremist groups in Tunisia has proven to be quite an empty one and completely over bloated and completely exaggerated. So um, the interest and, and the dynamics of, of weapons flow going to Tunisia, there will always be flows, but is, is that as relevant as it uh, was perhaps at a certain point? Not, I don't think necessarily. Um, is insecurity a problem? Yes, because there are many other forms of insecurity that, uh, that we will see. Um, but the, the, now that the situation is changing in Libya again, now that we can see that more goods are coming again into Libya, that the economy is a slight, I mean, the informal part, not the formal part, the informal part of the economies are picking up. Uh, we will see certainly something like a, a, a resurgence to a certain extent. Libyans and Tunisians are moving back and forth again between Tunisia and Libya. That means currency exchange in Formula One is getting more important. So we, we will see a little bit of, a, of a, a strengthening of that dynamic. The sad part about all that is that actually the Ben Gaden community had extended its hand to the government, to the international community and everyone to say, let's turn around. Uh, they showed that by celebrating this date, by organizing summer universities, by organizing celebrations, by inviting people to come and have dialogue with them. And this hand has not has been rejected basically on the grounds of narrow counter terrorist policies and now also migration, which is the other uh, disease basically of, of international politics. I mean, the reaction to it. And uh, so this is, this is, for me, what the situation is. In the broader scale of things, I think that um, in other parts of, uh, so in, in the Sahara Sahel, obviously, um, the scale and, and the problems related to, to armed groups has, have increased considerably. Um, Generally, I would say that the militarization or the paramilitarization. So 
it's it's just the amount of weapons i mean you you see you see bandits and that goes into large parts of africa now uh who are more and more weaponized and what i think we have to expect is to see that as as um the ceasefire holds and then un unless we don't have a new flare-up of, of, of a war in, in Libya. We have certainly surpluses of small arms and light weapons that, that we have that have been created now over the past uh, two, three years in, in, in Libya. And uh, it would be surprising to, to not see these surpluses end up in the black market and, and going back into recirculation. And the demand south of Libya is certainly is certainly high. Um, um, then it's an issue of, of price dynamics, which we would have to research. So here are, are lots of interesting things to be looking forward to. Um, and, uh, and, and, and other considerable factors. Again, uh, all that uh, should be, should be uh, finally once, I mean, I've, I've been advocating for it. Uh, I think my publications, a lot of the work we've done, we had done, a, a, I think, a very interesting uh, workshop at the time with with Sun. I think you have also put that uh, there, and where we where we were highlighting and trying to define recommendations of how to approach border communities in a different way, and really engage border communities as partners in 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 having community safety in in these areas. Um, and and I think this will unfortunately not be the case. Uh, because uh, again, there is an obsession with the problem of migration. Um, there will be more and more probably issues around drug trafficking, uh, as this is also uh, increasing. And there, for example, even the Syrian regime plays a more and important role uh, in in the dynamics in the in the region. And um, so I I. Um, I fear, unfortunately, that we're constantly not learning from, from the mistakes and from previous experiences, and that we will continue to have these over-securitized responses to, um, to these issues, um, but they've not improved through over-securitization. So the failure is there. I mean, you have the proof. <laughs> but uh, well, well, I think you know, insanity is when you do the same thing again and again and expect a different result. And, uh, here we go. And I mean, for that, I mean, there is a rather unwillingness and uh, inability, if you want, to learn from all these mistakes. And here I'm, I'm referring to Rebecca to connect what you just said, Monsa from Libya, with you know the current or the ongoing and the future um, developments related to to Libya. Talking about elections in December, uh, the Berlin Conference, uh, a smooth transition. Uh, uh, peace agreements, but I feel that we're we're missing the the idea of discussing the prerequisites to to security to that securitization that we're talking about. Like, what are the prerequisites to ensure security to ensure uh, smooth tra smooth transition? What shall we expect from December election? Assuming it will happen, obviously that that election will be meaningful. What can we expect from this uh, new round of Berlin um, uh, conference? So uh, what is your take on these issues, uh, Rebecca, thinking of, you know? Right. Uh, so uh, just uh, real briefly, because I think our time might be uh, short. Um, so, so I remember very well the 2012 elections, uh, Libya's first elections after uh, the fall of Gaddafi. And uh, they, they came off uh, in all over the country, but then nothing happened after. And, and looking back, it seemed really much like a tick at the box uh, exercise. And uh, heading into the elections that are scheduled for December 24th, if they happen, uh, that, that's one of the risks. Is, is this going to be a tick at the box that it completes an agenda or is 
is it going to lead to something more substantial? The way the current government, which was picked by 75 members of uh, the Libya Political uh, Dialogue Forum, uh, which was, uh, this was a, a UN um, exercise. Um, this current government, which is under Prime Minister Debeba, um, so far has shown that it's very big uh, in ministries and appointments and advisors and consultancies. Um, and they have really handed out a lot of seats to all sides of the aisle, so everyone benefits. Um, it's looking very much like a, a, a government where everyone gets a piece of the pie. Now they have been trying to pass the, gov uh, the budget through the HOR in the East that has failed so far. This is like previous times. And then we're going to have a polarized uh, situation like Siraj, uh, previous uh, president was facing, prime minister was facing. So, so that's one, uh, one aspect. Um, the, the conference that's tomorrow for Berlin, um, they are also, it's, it's going to be one uh, to make sure that the elections go on track, especially after the Amazi boycotted uh, a constitutional framework for it. So let's see, because the Amazi, uh, like Tuareg and Tabu, have been marginalized previously and they have not signed off on this. Um, so it's going to be trying to salvage that uh, in time for July 1st, which is when uh, this needs to be put in place. Um, it's also going to try and salvage uh, uh, things like the budget, etc. And also really uh, withdrawal of foreign troops, which as Monsef has pointed out and which we've talked about before, have always uh, kind of uh, steamrolled through Libya, all the different proxy forces and how they've been previously. So right now there is a, uh, this idea that you would get uh, Syrians who've been fighting, uh, funded by the Turks uh, to withdraw. You would get Syrians uh, who were funded by the UAE on behalf of Hefta to withdraw. Um, you would get the Turks and Wagner Group, which is Russian auxiliary government, to withdraw. So you, so you have a lot of withdrawals of, of these uh, foreigners uh, who are on uh, land and, and fighting for different things. But there isn't much incentive uh, from each uh, faction, uh, whether it's in the East or in the Tripoli-based government, to actually go ahead and do that with their, uh, with their alliances. So let's see what happens, because if they remain, um, we might see, uh, see instability for, for, here to, for here to come. Thank you, Rebecca, and uh, I mean, thank you all also for all these um, insights coming from different perspective. I do feel that this is very much a representative of our interdisciplinary work at, at SANA, covering similar issues, but from different perspectives, looking at the issues from uh, different lenses. And here I would like to end this with also uh, bringing an integral part of uh, or an integral part of the analysis, uh, which is where does how do we look at all these uh, issues from a gender perspective? Uh, and Hannah, you've been working uh, as part of your research at Unider, uh, how to integrate gender lens to analyze conflicts and conflict prevention. Uh, and of course, a lot can be said about about all of that. But what are your main takeaways uh, and key lines of arguments, if you want? Um, that you would like to share with us based on that. And from, from your positionality here as a, as a researcher, what are other thematic areas that you see are missing in the, in the existing knowledge and existing literature and analysis on the region of North Africa and Sahel that we need to urgently look at these conflicts uh, through? What are other uh, thematic uh, areas? Wow, big questions. <laughs> I like. um, no, thank you. I'm, I appreciate that you are um, bringing in the gender perspective because I think it's important. You know, at Unidir, uh, in the gender and disarmament program, we, um, we try to highlight the gender considerations in arms control and disarmament. And um, so I'm going to address sort of this question in two ways. So um, first on the methodological and research side, I think one of the things we've noticed is um, really a lack of gender disaggregated data in this, in this sector. Um, and whether it's a sort of lack of gender disaggregated data about arms proliferation, um, I mean, 
we really don't know, especially in the Sahara, uh, Sahara Sahel region, um, how this proliferation is affecting uh, people of different gender identities and men and women, boys and girls differently. Uh, and that, that's a sort of a key, a key thing to um, consider and, and take into account. And I think, um, you know, if we, if we would, we would know this, if there was more data, we could possibly uh, use it for um, sort of conflict prevention strategies. You know, if we knew if certain arms and ammunition were linked to specific, you know, trends in gender-based violence, we could wield, um, you know, international instruments or arms embargoes to really address these issues. Um, and I think, you know, just from an arms and disarmament perspective, we do have these instruments such as the Arms Trace Treaty uh, and Article 7, which addresses this issue of, you know, arms proliferation and gender-based violence. But what we don't have, again, is the data. So what we're seeing a lot of the times when we're speaking about Article 7 to member states and exporting states, what they're saying is, well, we don't know what's happening in terms of gender-based violence in this country. So we can't be sure <laughs> if these weapons will be used you know, for the for this kind of or for human rights violation, which, you know, um, is obviously a problem and is 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 uh, a, an excuse, let's say, that is used over and over again. Um, and so, in relation to this, like I think we what um, in Libya and in Mali, uh, uh, there was an emphasis um, a couple of years ago on the gender perspective. Now, I think. There, this has been lost. And I think what we're seeing um, right now because of the pandemic um, is uh, moving away from the gender perspective, uh, basically because, you know, as researchers, as, as um, decision makers, we have this like more pressing issue, which is the, the pandemic and, and how this is exacerbating the conflicts there. Um, however, you know, there's been reports of increased insecurity for women and girls, you know, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Niger, by humanitarian actors. And so I think there should be sort of more research around that and highlighting the, the, this issue of, uh, and the link between um, like insecurity for women and girls and fragility. Um, and what tends to be happening um, in this region and in other regions as well is that we are sort of losing those small gains that we've made on gender equality, which can contribute to stability, to the pandemic. And we're really reverting back and the radical narratives are reverting back. Um, and this is a really dangerous trend, I think, um, in Mali and in the Sahara Sahel region that we should um, be investigating. Um, and I would say, um, there is a very sort of interesting and emerging link between um, gender, climate change, and conflict in the region. Um, and this is something that uh, has, you know, there has been studies on climate change and, in the region and its effect on conflict, and also about gender, but not bringing those two together. Uh, and I think that would be um, quite interesting and uh, quite um, important to, to do in my view. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for all these um, um, ideas and, and arguments. I, we, we definitely ran out of time, and I, I, I apologize for that. And, um, and thank you, Munsa, for picking up the, um, uh, the questions in the, uh, in the chat function, in the chat of, um, of this panel. I do have one last question, but I will not there now. Um, maybe I will ask it, but I will not. I don't think we have time, but I'm always puzzled by who will dictate the future of this region and how? I mean, if we had this panel 2012 or so, we will say the people will dictate the future of this region. It is the Libyans, it is the Tunisians, it's the people. But now uh, we might have a different, uh, more complex maybe picture about who will dictate this um, region and its future and, and how. But maybe we uh, keep this, um, uh, question open for now, unless one of you will not be able to sleep tonight if you don't uh, put your two cents here. Um, 
uh, but if you can all go to sleep fine, so I think um, I allow myself to conclude this panel and uh, with this to kind of also officially conclude the third cycle of, of SANA project security assessment in, uh, in North Africa and um, and uh, thank all our uh, experts, all the people that we've been in touch over the years, all the policymakers that we hope, hopefully that we informed uh, our multiple donors that contributed to the success of, of this project. So it's really a big thank you to, um, uh, to all involved and in, in this project. And uh, I really hope that we will continue in the fourth cycle of this project as starting from 1st of July, so only in a couple of days, and we continue these uh, webinars and these and publication of the different research. And for our audience, since uh, early May, we started a series of these webinars that all of them are available on our website, and we uh, conducted a number of um, experts briefing covering uh, issues related to security in Morocco, Libya, um, uh, uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Mali, and, uh, and other places in addition to the, uh, to the panel of today. So I encourage you to, to check them out on our uh, website and I truly hope you will find them helpful and insightful and that you enjoy them as much as I enjoyed moderating uh, many of them. Uh, over the past weeks. So thank you um, all once again. Thank you, uh, Hannah. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Monsef, uh, for, um, for being with us today. And uh, it's uh, congratulations to all of us as a collective behind this, uh, this project. And thanks again for all your contribution to its success. Well, thank, thank you, especially to you, Allah, uh, for having taken up the legacy and uh, successfully uh, and you actually brought Sana, I think, to another level. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monsef. Thank you very much, Hala. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank all. you. Um, thank you to Ala and um, to the survey, really, yeah, for continuing to uh, push on um, evidence-based analysis. So yeah, look forward to phase four. <laughs> Wonderful. On that note, thank you all. Please take care and okay. uh, see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.